Hello, I'm Rosalinda. Welcome to the very first episode of the Global Salon podcast. It's a conversation bringing together game changers from different places, cultures, and occupations who probably wouldn't usually meet. The conversation itself will be very informal, but I'll do the formal introductions first. Dr. Emma Heslop is a physical oceanographer. Since 2018, Emma is a program specialist for the Global Ocean Observing System, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in Paris. In particular, her role is to support the development and implementation of ambitious Global Ocean Observing System which is part of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021 to 2030. And we're joined from Delhi by Hermant Sagar, an, an entrepreneur, fashion designer, and sustainability pioneer. After many successful years in Paris, in partnership with his partner Didier Leconet, today he owns Leconet Hermant, which is India's only couture house as well as developing a sustainable fashion line and the fabric Rami, which is a sustainable alternative to cotton. But before we begin, just a little about UNESCO. Established 75 years ago at the end of World War II, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization was founded to promote world peace and security through international cooperation in education, the sciences and culture. Hello, Emma. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Hermant. Hello, nice to be here. Oh, well, it's lovely. What a great conversation. Paris, Delhi, and Palma de Mallorca. Right. <laughs> Some amazing places. Amazing places. And, and so interesting that you two have several things in common, too. Now, Emma, um, would you like to tell us about your life before you became an oceanographer? Sure, because uh, oceanography for me is a second career. So, so I changed sort of mid-career and, and started oceanography. But I guess my, my love of um, earth sciences, of which oceanography is one, started quite a bit earlier than that. I was fascinated by, by rocks as a kid and stones and, and mountains. And so at university, I studied geology and paleontology and sedimentology, which sounds a bit technical, but um, it's all about, a lot of the sedimentary rocks are laid down in the ocean, of course. And so sort of understanding that the passage of time, um, the rise and fall of the oceans and, uh, you know, the various sort of species that have been alive and where they lived and where they moved to, very much a part of uh, my, my sort of formative years at, uh, at university and you know th this is you see it happening in the world now with with climate change and, and other sorts of threats but but much faster and kind of you know in real time um, slightly scary in some ways so um, so you know you can see connections sort of right back in the roots uh, when I left university I then went into business um, and uh, I was interested in sort of uh, sales and marketing and strategy. And I landed on my feet in the IT industry um, in some amazing years when the internet was really just beginning to take off as a visual medium. And I worked in, uh, first of all, image compression, uh, in image compression technology, and then later on um, in transaction processing. So, you know, the things that we see that have come to pass today, like uh, compressing videos so that we can, you know, I'm, I now watch films on my on my iPhone. These were ideas that seemed kind of, you know, crazy and really out there at the time that people were talking about them, you know, 20 years ago. And, and I think it was a good grounding in new markets, the way technology changes the, the world and that we don't, you know, we can't where we're sitting here see exactly how things are going to be but you can have some foresight and you move in that direction and yeah you know a, a lot gets done in in 10 years or so which will be interesting to talk about when we talk about the uh, the ocean decade absolutely so what what led you into this though what led me into oceanography, into oceanography. Uh, sailing so uh i i kind of stopped working for a bit which is a a, a a grand luxury. I did sell my house and I went sailing. Um, 
and sailed across the Atlantic and, and all around the Mediterranean and sort of the Caribbean. But what that really brought home to me, and it planted the seed that, that later moved me into studying and then working in oceanography, was A, how vast the oceans are when you, when you cross in a boat. It takes you days and you do it yourself, but you're, you're out there. It's, uh, it's, you know, the oceans are vast. Um, the, 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 the sort of the physical processes are also there. So when you're sailing, you can feel the currents. Um, when you look at an almanac, there are all these wind roses that sort of tell you what time of year is optimal to cross, et cetera, et cetera. So this whole system that I didn't understand and I, you know, fascinated me. And finally, the kind of the impetus was the, the change and the, the feeling of change in the in the environment was um, when, when the marineros sort of take your lines, when you come to moor up in a marina or something, you perhaps ask them about the weather or or what's sort of up the coast and things. And a message that, that came out many, many times was, well, it would have been, I would have said it was like this, but I'm not sure anymore that the world is changing. It's not the same as it was. It's blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the, the marine environment is changing. And this really kind of planted a, a, a seed. You know, this was in the Caribbean, also in the Mediterranean. So that kind of impulsed me to think, something's happening here and a there's a lot I don't understand b it looks pretty important to me <laughs> c something's happening right now and so putting that together with climate change and knowing I did geology and knowing I, I just understood things impulsed me to to think maybe I could do something in this uh, in this sector um you know in in terms of understanding but but also using my my business career and and all that I learned in business over the years Yes, so oceanography, big subject. It is, but I mean, it's the most amazing subject for me. I mean, it's uh, uh, obviously, you know, with sailing and everything, I have a, a, a love of the ocean, but I think that love of the ocean is shared by, by many, many people. So uh, for me, it was just always a pleasure to, um, to study oceanography and I studied physical oceanography. So that's my kind of, I, I'm, I'm really profoundly interested in the, the physical and the natural world. So how the current systems work, the ocean conveyor belt, um, you know, how the, the, the deep ocean gets reoxygenated with deep water formation that also incidentally has been storing an awful, awful lot of the, the, the carbon dioxide that's been heating the, the earth um, and, and the heat itself. So I'm, you know, this area is, is of interest to me, but there's also biogeochemistry um, if you're sort of interested in chemical reactions. And this has a strong interplay with the physics of the ocean. And of course, biology, if you're interested more in creatures and plants, then, you know, there's a whole kind of ecosystems, many, many ecosystems out there in the ocean. So many different areas to, to study in, in oceanography. And obviously, given sort of what, what led me into oceanography, I also studied the climate's impact on the ocean and climate dynamics. And this, uh, you know, a, a primary impulse for me and, and very important for, for where we are today. Super interesting. Yes, absolutely. Is it true we know less about our oceans than the planets? <laughs> I Sorry, I didn't when, quite hear I that. I'm hearing that we know less about our own oceans than we know about Mars and Jupiter. That's right. It's, uh, I, I wouldn't say necessarily less. It's the fact that they're, they're mapping so the, the, we have more um, detailed maps of the surface of Mars than we have of our ocean beds. Yes. And, you know, this, this is that kind of statistic really brings it home to us. Oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface, right? And, you know, the oceans are six kilometers deep. So in, in the sort of the, you know, in the deep plains, that's a, that's a sort of an average. Um, but... So that's a that's a huge kind of surface area, a huge volume. Um, and so, you know, ocean observing, which is the part of oceanography where where I'm working um, that I believe is really fundamentally important to understanding climate and to to our future. Um, it's, it's big science. We, we can't be everywhere all of the time. And also, you know, the ocean environment is harsh. We have you know, the, the Arctic extremes, the weather extremes, big storms in the ocean, you know, 
having crossed the ocean, big waves. So equipment that goes out into the ocean is uh, needs to be robust. Um, so it, it, it's a big science. We need technology, we need robust equipment, and we need a really good cooperation. The, you know, the ocean is, uh, the oceans uh, beyond the sort of exclusive economic zones are, are, are global property, so to speak. And so, we, we need collaboration between nations, which is also, you know, a very good reason for the Global Ocean Observing System to be housed under, under UNESCO, under the International Oceanographic Commission to, to enable that cooperation. Is there any global legislation that all countries follow? There is an amazing piece of global legislation. Uh, it's not specific to, um, to ocean observing, but it, it plays a role in what we do. And this is uh, UNCLOS, which is around the law of the sea. And so this governs many, many aspects of the law of the sea. It governs, um, for example, you know, navigation for ships and things like that, and the, the safe passage of ships through into national waters. Um, and I can do fishing and commercial stuff like that. There are international cooperations again on, on fishing, um, and uh, there are some international cooperations on, on pollution on shipping um, that's generally covered under IMO. There's a lot of misuse, I suppose. <laughs> Less so than there was, I think. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've seen even since I've been in uh, oceanography in the last, um, you know, 12, 13 years is the big the sea change I shouldn't really say sea change but uh, the 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 change the big change in in um, people's awareness of the role of the oceans both in our climate but also um, the pressures on the ocean and the role of the oceans in our future in terms of sustainability and so uh, when I first started doing um, my master's in oceanography, that was my kind of transition course from one career to another. Um, you know, I, I was explaining to my friends how stuff works and, you know, why are you doing oceanography? Well, it's important. Now people say, how are the oceans doing? Uh, what's happening with climate? You know, the, the conversation has changed completely in 10 years. And this, you know, we need to go further, but this is already a big step. Well, Emma, let's go, let's start talking about, I never know how you pronounce it for short, the Global Ocean Observing System. Goose. Goose, we call it Goose, good. And um, about that and your role within that. Okay, so the Global Ocean Observing uh, system, GOOS, is uh, a coordination body. It sits under the International um, Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, the IOC of UNESCO, and it was founded in um, 1991 with the aim to coordinate um, sustained ocean observing across, um, across nations towards reaching um, global understandings. And so initially it was quite a bit focused on climate, um, you know, the, the growing, growing understanding of the ocean's role in climate and the fact that, you, you know, you need to coordinate these really uh, large scale missions and coordinate the dissemination of information and cooperation amongst scientists to, to, um, to, to, to gain, the, uh, gain the answers. And so the, the other, thing about oceanography is that the the ocean varies on a on a broad range of time scales from you know just you know seconds and 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 minutes but right the way through to hours days and then there are um oscillations that happen seven to ten years like like enso in 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 the pacific which which uh, is a, has a profound effect on seasonal weather patterns sort of el nino and la nina but then also on 30 year time scales um and the ocean interacts with the atmosphere so you need to be observing for a long time in order to sort out these patterns and the interaction between these patterns. So for some things you need to be monitoring for, uh, you know, 30 plus years consistently in the same place. So when we say sustained ocean observing, we really mean sustained ocean observing. Um, 
and other things that we're trying to track, you know, say the, the heat content of the ocean and how that's evolving through time, you know, the deep currents that move, you know, at centimeters, um, you, 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 you need to be doing decadal surveys of, of you know, a wide set of variables to be able to track these, these slow moving long-term changes. But with the volume, they make a vast difference to, to our climate and, and you know, how, how we understand the storing of carbon, for instance, and, and, and heat content, et cetera, et cetera. And then sort of perhaps at the surface where the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, you need measurements coming in every six hours so that they can flow into the weather models um, and, you know, for inform weather forecasts and maritime forecasts, you know, perhaps it's about wave height or, or storm warnings or, or flood warnings or whatever it is. So the ocean operates on, on you know, a, a wide range of, of scales, the phenomena, and also the, the applications, the uses. So we, we, we need sustained and uh, consistent monitoring of the ocean to be able to provide the answers and provide the data for, for all the various services that we that we need. And, and can you describe your role within this? So uh, I'm supporting, um, but uh, responsible for parts of the implementation of, um, we have a very, within the Global Ocean Observing System, I'm a program specialist. And I work with a small team here in Paris. And then there we have other parts of the, the GOOS organization scattered uh, uh, around the globe, working on in different continents and in different uh, ocean observing systems. So we have a number of expert panels who, who, who really look at the requirements for ocean observing um, from biogeochemistry, physics, and bioeco. We have uh, implementation networks. We have networks that do the monitoring and I work very closely with them. Um, and then we also have uh, ocean modeling, um, an expert team in, in that area. So as a program specialist, I'm supporting really the, the, the coordination around the networks, but then also the, the, the core coordination for GOOS. Um, and this involves working with uh, national representatives, nations, uh, perhaps institutions, but also we have a, an ambitious new strategy with a, with a big vision to uh, be monitoring all the essential variables for, um, for both sort of human health and ocean health and to deliver all the services we need for the blue economy, uh, but, you know, for safety and security um, and, and also for climate. So, this is, you know, working on the implementation of the strategy, and this is a decadal project, is, is a big part of, of what I'm involved in. And we've really, really just started down that track. So, um, yeah, coordination, and uh, that's a big part of what I do. A bit like you, bringing, bringing people together and helping to, to make change. Fascinating. A global organization of this kind all around the planet, satellites probably involved in deep sea measuring devices and don't ask me what. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's right. So we now have something like there are 12 global ocean observing networks um, and one of the most recent uh, additions to a global observing network is uh, is is in fact based on marine mammals. Um, they have sensors attached to them, sort of um, th that fall off within a year um, and and do no harm to the animal. But uh, they also provide um, much needed uh, information in the polar regions because they're made, they're attached to seals and things like that. So the information tracks where the seals are, where they're feeding, you know, perhaps how they're interacting, what their paths are. And then it's also tracking the ocean information at the same time. So the ocean information can go to the models for uh, forecasts in that region, but also be used by the um, bio eco um, uh, scientists in order to, to understand the, the species and around preservation and conservation and management. So it's a kind of a, a dual process, but we've got probably 
I don't know. I think there's almost 9,000 um, platforms of one sort or another in the water now. We have big global arrays such as Argo, which are profiling to 2,000 meters. And uh, we're soon bringing on new biogeochemical variables on, on those platforms. So really increasing the, the richness of the data. And interestingly enough, I was thinking over Christmas, as you do when you have a break, that you know, we're really coming into the age, I think, of big data for oceanography. Um, previously, you know, when things were not on autonomous platforms, we weren't able to use uh, as many autonomous platforms as we do today. It would be ships going out with people on board, which we still need, but we also have these other autonomous platforms to take measurements. And so, you know, one cruise uh, would, would come back with this data and then the scientists would work on that. But we now have autonomous platforms delivering data in real time into weather and all sorts of other applications, climate, etc. And we are getting to, we really are at the stage where ocean data is becoming big data. And I really think that there's a a vast commercial opportunity, put my commercial hat on again, for, for people to build new services based on this, new information services for, for managers um, and all sorts of other applications for understanding the ocean. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> so I should have brought some pictures along of, uh, of, the, of the various platforms to kind of... Uh, would you like to ask something? Well, I mean, there's plenty of stuff that would be totally fascinating. I always imagine the planet without the ocean and how irregular the form must be. But when you say that the sea is only, the oceans are only an average of six kilometers deep, expect, except for certain places like the, I suppose, the Mariana Trench and other places, which goes down deeper than that, um, that those irregularities are just minor. And, and the planet still is absolutely round. I imagined it always as a, like a walnut or something, because I imagined that a big part of the ocean just had water stuck to it and there was nothing underneath, but apparently all the earth and, the, and, the, and, and, and land is connected. That's absolutely correct. Um, I, I mean, you know, geologically speaking, we'll go to another thing. There's quite a, you know, there's quite a, a depth and a radius to, to, to the earth. But the oceans are, um, I mean, the oceans are, are a part of what enables life on this planet, I think. Yes. You know, they, they, they deliver every second breath of, of, of the air that we breathe in terms of oxygen. Um, they've been settling down and absorbing so much uh, of the carbon dioxide that's been keeping our planet um, climate from sort of running off the rails much earlier they you know the we our livelihood as a species is fundamentally intertwined with 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 the oceans and i i would also put forward with the health of the oceans with the biodiversity of the oceans with the resources of the oceans and with the uh, processes that that are that are happening within the ocean all of which are being impacted by 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 um, climate, by climate change. Yeah, but I, in in answer to your sort of depth question, six kilometers might might not sound very much, but it's higher than Everest. And yes, so yes, when we when we think yes, so when we think about the sort of the things that stick out on top of land, the oceans are generally deeper than uh, than we have, you know, um, mountains. Pretty amazing stuff. And uh, one of my first, what really converted me to doing a PhD and to pursuing um, sort of a, a deeper scientific career in oceanography was my professor at uh, Southampton University, Professor Harry Bryden, uh, took uh, me or suggested I should go on a, um, a, a deep ocean cruise, which I did. Uh, and we um, renovated the moorings on a really important uh, monitoring line uh, that's monitoring the ocean currents, the deep ocean currents, the, the Atlantic conveyor belt, which is a, you know, profoundly important to ocean circulation. And uh, 
when those 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 uh, moorings are six kilometers deep. So when you go on a go on a vessel to retrieve these moorings, they they put a sort of a a modem, a sonic modem, down in the water. It it sort of makes these beeping noises, communicates with the uh, mooring in the deep, which releases the mooring, and then you wait for the mooring to to come up to the surface, and you reel in six kilometers of mooring, taking off all the instruments and and storing that data and that data is that those instruments have been down there for two years collecting data quietly on the uh, on on the ocean currents and then you need to re-put out the mooring so this is a big ship trailing six kilometers of wire behind it with all the various instruments and then at some point you just release it and the weight carries it to the bottom of the ocean and there it sort of stands buoyed up by uh, by floats for for six years so it really is big organized science to to get the data we need now not everything needs to be as complicated as that we need a, a mix of platforms to monitor the ocean as i've said satellites as well um but also these autonomous platforms but some of but it you know it, it it's big science you need uh, um international cooperation and and uh, you know serious organization be able only to do unesco that. only unesco members or are they are there more countries i mean is, is everybody a, a, a unesco member the the ioc um the international uh, oceanographic commission has 150 members member states oh, yes. um so and even you know a couple of um mem you know uh, states that are not uh, that don't have an ocean are, are profoundly interested in uh, mm -hmm. oceanography because it has a profound impact on on weather patterns and things like that but they're primarily nations with with coastlines but that's really quite a lot of of, of nations that are involved in in IOC of UNESCO uh, having said that there are it's a smaller number of nations that are doing the majority of the observing of the sustained observing to date and Emma in terms of beyond sort of national uh, involvement. What about the maritime community, sort of merchant ships and, and yachting? How involved are they? So amongst the various platforms that we have, we have, you know, autonomous gliders, Argo floats, you know, with the big oceanographic vessels um, doing these decadal service, uh, surveys. We also have um, a fleet, if you like, of voluntary ships. And this is a, these are very important platforms for us as well. So, and these are fulfilling several, um, several purposes. So the, the commercial shipping um, uh, can, can get involved um, through uh, VOS, which is uh, voluntary observing ships. And this is where, I mean, you know, I didn't know it before coming into oceanography, but but all, um, you know, captains and 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 the uh, the officers are trained in in taking, um, you know, uh, ocean and atmospheric measurements because they write it into their their logs. But we now collect this digitally, either with um, automated stations on board ships, or through sort of a, a, a digital interface, and this is then sent. Uh, direct to the um, to onto the the global um, data transmission system, the GTS, which is uh, operated by the World Meteorological Organization, that shares this data with all of the um, all of the um, national weather services uh, globally. And so the data from from these voluntary ships and, you know, they, they can be container ships, they can be all sorts of different sorts of ships, uh, you know, crossing on their on their routes that that data then is um, supplied directly to the GTS. But it then, you know, it comes back as a service to those ships in terms of improved weather forecasts, but improved weather forecasts for for everybody, include um, maritime and uh, and uh, and on land, so so these are really important. Um, we also have ships that uh, go across specific transects and will launch uh, profiles that will take uh, temperature probes across some of the currents, some of the major currents. So more uh, more temporal measurements of of major currents, and so these are uh, called SOUP, um, the ship of uh, opportunity program. We also have 
um, uh, another group of um, sort of ships of opportunity, ferries, um, and sort of similar ships where you get a, a, something called the continuous plankton recorder fitted, so monitoring plankton, which can be important in areas where you're looking for invasive species and things like that. But it's also one of the longest biological records we have of, of, of plankton. This was started some time ago, ferry boxes and other uh, biological measurement. And then most recently, some really great uh, cooperation with the racing community, with uh, uh, the yachting racing community, let's say, and um, the Amoka class yachts. And so right now, the, the Vendee Globe is, is, is going ahead um, with all its various excitements, but 13 of the 33 uh, ships and skippers have on board um, floats, or Argo floats or other sorts of scientific instrumentation for monitoring the, uh, for example, carbon and plastics. Um, and so these guys who are, you know, they're real heroes because having a, you know, a, an extra 20 kilos on board these vessels is, is not necessarily their, um, you know, ideal, but they believe so much in the science and in getting and in playing a part in getting these measurements in remote areas, in the remote areas they sail, where perhaps the commercial shipping is, is not so operational, that they've been willing to take these floats on board and, and launch them en route. So I, I think this is a, you know, this is a terrific cooperation. And, and also we get the skippers speaking about why they're doing it, which really kind of catches the eye of, of, uh, of, kids and and people who who really follow the racing you know it's uh these guys are real heroes they really go out there um in so, so uh, you mean they just, the volunteer, they hmm? just they volunteer with you and they and they and they kind of just propose their services because they're on the yachts anyway or is this are these actual enterprises so uh so imoka which it, uh, is is a sort of a class of yacht and uh there, there's also the idea that with the the manufacturer that um to be able to have some um fittings that that will um will enable the equipment to be mounted uh, in in future classes of yachts is, is something that's sort of happening under the hood and so that's a sort of a, a more of a cooperation with industry but at the moment it's really a cooperation with the with the organizers of these sort of racing classes and racing uh, competitions and and the skippers themselves um, I mean most most people who are sailors uh, you know fundamentally believe in the importance of the ocean and are really keen to do something to support the oceans in in some way or other and you see people you know sailors and people who've done things about plastics to to look at trying to change the the outcome of the oceans sort of in a, in a sense of 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 plastics this is quite a lot of that's been born at least partially within the sailing community uh, but also from the science side so I think it was last year on one of the one of the big races um, some of the yachts had um, both carbon and plastic monitoring um, capability as well as temperature and salinity and so gathering observations in in areas that, that really are sparsely monitored like the southern ocean um, of, of these elements is, is just fantastic. And if you can do that year after year after year, you begin to build up a picture of, of, of what's happening. And we can use observations and models together to begin to make that sort of pattern more apparent. So the interplay between sort of ocean models and, and observations is, is really important. Emma, am I right in saying that uh... I mean, the Mocha are like rock stars in sailing, really, aren't they? That's who they Absolutely. are. Absolutely. They go through the most dangerous waters and um, everything else. But am I right in saying that you're setting up a, is there a pilot scheme that could include more people, more uh, active yachts? I, I really hope so, yes. So, um, and I, you know, I, um, we, we, we're not there yet. 
Um, but there is interest from from several different groups, and you know there have been a, a couple of calls to to try and and work on that. And I, what I feel, um, uh, what I perceive, uh, is is a real commitment from the racing community to say we we really should do this. Um, and I and I hope, and we have to find the you know the the right way because what what it, it needs to be something that's uh, feasible so oceanography is is long-term ocean monitoring is 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 about what what's needed the requirements but also what's feasible because what's needed is is more than any of us can afford quite frankly yeah. um so we need to work out you know what we what feasibly we can do sort of both technology and in, in the case with yachting um you know that that's not so burdensome on the crew so that uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense or, or too heavy or, or such delicate instruments that, um, that they're not going to survive the, the mission. So we need to find that sort of balance between um, what, what's needed and, and something that's practical and that will function. But yes, those, those discussions have, have started. So I, I you know, where would we look into the future, you know, perhaps with a decade or, or something like that, we could actually have uh, a program where yachts were, um, racing yachts, all or a big proportion of them were all equipped taking these types of measurements um, every year. I mean, the, it would just begin to build up a fantastic database in these remote areas. Yeah. What's the step in help that you expect you know, right now to the yachts that will, can, can, can Mr. Anybody start helping us yet, or is this still too early? So this is a really interesting question. And uh, my, my, my gut feeling is that the, the, the technology is pretty much here, okay? Um, it might need some adjustment, but I think we have the technology to, to take the measurements, or at least it's, it's ready to be adapted. What we need to find is is the the sweet spot of, of practicality and how people can get involved, um, yeah. and and I think cost because uh, I suspect at the end of the day it would be something that that people would opt into. So sort of a bit like citizen science, people opt in their time essentially mm -hmm. because they're interested and they they want to be a part of of making a difference. Um, and a part of contributing um, and putting back, I guess. Uh, and so I wonder whether um, we would perhaps start with um, those who were, those who are occupying their, their vessels more sort of around the year, perhaps professional crews. And there's quite a lot of uh, sort of professional yachts because, and th these yachts also, you know, they go quite big distances because we're looking for observations um, in, in the first instance, perhaps uh, across, um, you know, across the oceans in remote places where, where people are not regularly getting to. So, so I think we have the technology. We, I think people are willing, we, we, we need to sort of move forward step by step uh, and find a kind of a sweet spot, a pilot where we can really get things initiated. And I suspect like with professional crew, with, with people who would be willing to, to kind of prove the case um, would, would be a, a good first step because also the data has got to go somewhere. So we, we need to, you know, people need to be willing to perhaps shoulder a bit of uh, communications cost to transmit the data to shore in somewhere or other. But, you know, this could be across people's mobile phones when, uh, you know, when you, when you, when you're nearing shore, it doesn't have to be via satellite phone real time or, or whatever. So, you know, I think I think a dialogue between and and between a sort of a, a group of interested um, yacht uh, yacht owners who are using their yachts a lot, um, and the oceanographic community could could form a pilot where we could then take that out, and of course, you know people are people are sailing globally in in quite remote places all around New Zealand all around Australia I, I really think it would enrich the data collection um, 
in in a very profound way and especially because we now need to we need to move ocean observations closer into the coast right um we we some of the elements we need for for uh, uh, in the sort of the open ocean um are are well collected but some of the challenges and these are challenges that goose is interested in, in addressing underneath the decade is to move what we, the organization and the um, cooperation and collaboration that we have uh, in the global ocean into the coast and the connection between modeling and services. There's quite a lot of observations happening in the coast, but not enough for where we want to go with say marine spatial planning um, and, and to meet all the sustainable development goals, a number of which are, are impacted by the ocean. Okay, and, and could you say more to us about the, the decade itself? Sure, I would love to, because I think this is really super important, not just because it's um, partly the idea was born under the IOC, but um, okay, so the decade or the ocean decade is um, the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And it started uh, just four days ago on the 1st of January. So there's been a build up for the last year and a half, two years in getting the ideas and the implementation plan ready. And you can go up to the website to learn more. But the, the decade of ocean science is broader than just ocean observing, but ocean observing is a, is a big underpinning of um, the, the decade, the ocean decade. But the ocean decade is all around um, the, the, the science that we want for the ocean we want. OK, so it's about changing the outcome for the ocean. The ocean or the oceans are under quite um, strong pressure with with climate change um, and also with with human impacts. And if and we're also asking more from the ocean, um, you know, perhaps through uh, sustainable farming of fish, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mineral resources, you know, wh whatever it's going to be, we, we need to learn to manage our relationship with the oceans. You know, a decade ago, they were they were just treated like, you know, the rubbish dump, you know, ships just went offshore, anything could be chucked in the ocean. And, you know, today we're at the state where almost all fish species are kind of overfished. Mm -hmm. And we've had population collapses of fish species. We have problems with um, uh, pollution in, 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 in many areas, pressure of actual human occupation in, in, in coastal zones and in sort of zones of pristine seas, plus the effects of climate on things like, uh, for example, corals. It's, it's an obvious one that everybody knows. Um, and, the, you know, the heat waves and coral bleaching events. But that, that pressure, that climate pressure, you know, the corals are very obvious, but it's happening in a less obvious way in, in many other parts, in deoxygenation of the ocean, in the increase the, in acidity. Now, these are very subtle changes, but to organisms that live in the ocean, these are profound. So if we want to have a sustainable future, we must up the science up the observations as well and we need to really focus on it and so this is really what the ocean decade is about is about enabling us to be in the position to make a step change in in the science and what we do so that we can have this kind of long-term sustainable relationship um, if not uh, we you know with the in a similar way to climate, we, we will be facing, um, you know, long term issues for, for, for mankind in one way or another. Are there enough people involved? Not yet. Not yet. Nor huh? enough money. Yeah. Not yet. Oh. Um, but I but I think, you know, the, the ocean decade has has just started. Yes. Um, and it, 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 it's 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 a decade uh, for, for good reason, is it will take time to um, to get that first phase of, of, of answers. And it's really also about not doing business as usual within science. Change needs, needs to happen within science as well, within my community. Um, you know, we need to break down the silos. Different sciences need to work together. We can't 
for a moment pretend that we can carry on, you know, biogeochemistry doing biogeochemistry and physics doing physics or by, uh, you know, ecology not uh, linked to the physics. We need to link the sciences more closely together and the data sets and also, uh, you know, the, the, the data and the observations. Um, and then we need to link this which is a, a, a major push of mine coming from the business background to the societal outcomes, to the services, to the delivery. Um, so these are big pushes within GOOS as well, and they're echoed within the, within the decade, but on an even broader scale, because it's not just about ocean observations. And a big part of what the decade needs to do will be in education on ocean literacy because, and this is where perhaps, you know, we, we, we go into a change conversation. In order for this to happen, um, I, I, I realized uh, sitting in an early conversation, the first sort of global ocean decade workshop that there was in, in, in um, Copenhagen was, uh, we need to change mindsets, not just, but also engage people more in the ocean. Um, in the UK, David Attenborough has, has done a fabulous job with the Blue Planet, and those messages are really quite clear. But I don't think they're as clear globally, um, and we need to go a lot further. As if we need a bit more of activism for it. Uh, agreed, agreed. And Greta Thunberg and, and people like her are, are inspirational. Yes. Um, and I, you know, we need to both ignite the fascination with the ocean because there's still more to be explored, um, and also the a, a sense of urgency uh, about and a sense of agency of of people. You know, for I guess my my sort of goal because we we won't get. Um, the information nor, nor the science we need unless oceans move up the political agenda, I don't think, of nations. This is fundamental. And that's about societal change. So people can, can enact this change. I mean, you know, we, we're all voters and we indicate to government what is important to us and where, where I would like to see the oceans. Obviously, I, I don't think that oceans should sort of be, be top of the agenda that unrealistic given healthcare and you know food security whatever these these things will come first but you know maybe fifth place or something like that the oceans are are fundamentally important oceans and the environment we we won't be surviving uh unless we manage better our relationship with the you know with with the components of, of the planet that really really nurture us one of the things that strikes me is that um, we understand that people who are on the shoreline appreciate it, how important it is for them, but that actually everybody on the planet needs to realize how, how fundamental it is to their own well-being. I mean, even if you're in somewhere that's totally landlocked, it's phenomenal. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, Rosalinda. And how, how you do that, I mean, I'm... You know, I have some experience of communications from from work, but I am not the communicator on 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 the scale of sort of David Attenborough and uh, and the likes of um, I don't know, sort of even uh, National Geographic and and people like that who really know and know their audience and know how to speak to people on a larger scale about the. The, the natural environment. I think we need the help of, of, of these people on board to really help m make, make the case and make the change in, in people's minds. And you, you mentioned UNESCO earlier on, and I was reflecting that it really is, um, it was very, you know, foresightful. And I think it's a, an important vision for today is, is UNESCO sets about to create peace in the minds of men. It's about changing the mindset. And I, and I really think that this is part of what, what we need to, to bring forward so that exactly as you say, Rosalinda, that, that everybody has a, has a basic understanding of the importance of the oceans. And it doesn't seem crazy 
to um, to look at uh, you know part of um, part of a nation's GDP going to to support that effort. When you look at the quantity of all these urgencies around us, and you're speaking of subtle things that indicate them, like acidification or deoxidization, uh, sorry, deoxygenization of the of the oceans, and you compare it to something as subtle as the disappearing of the bees. Um, there are all these indicators that come together and I'm sure they're linked. I wish there was a study somewhere that would show us in the oceans it's that way, in the air it's that way, in the earth it's that way. There are no more earthworms, we don't have enough insects, we don't have enough. We have fish full of plastic, we have oceans full of plastic, we have, we have problems all over the place. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's, uh, you know, the impact of, of I think, humanity is, yes. is really beginning to understand more profoundly its impact on a variety of species, be it sort of from industrial farming, industrial fishing, et cetera, et cetera. And that the, we, we've become so efficient um, at doing all these things that there is, there is no margin for error for nature anymore. And nature is getting, you know, consistently impacted and com combining that with the additional pressure of, of, of climate change. One and you have a, a mix that says, um, you know, it, it, it's not really going to work out well unless we do something, unless we, unless we enact this change. And so I'm, I'm really happy to, you know, to be here and to sort of talk about this with you. Because also as members of society, um, and, and you yourself as, um, as an entrepreneur uh, in, in industry, seeing this change, you know, be it the fashion industry and saying, I am gonna do something about this. We, we, we can all do something um, and we can all uh, decide to, to change our ways as far as possible individually, but support our governments in, in making change. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'm gonna you know, hesitate to, to name sort of COVID-19 and the, the, the pandemic, um, but for all of its, you know, uh, poor impacts on, on the world, I think there are some positive impacts. And one of them from my perspective is the fact that people can, if they have to, change their habits overnight, that we all are quite well aware in, in a way that I think we weren't starting at the start of last year, that we're able to, to change and that this will be needed for the future, but that, you know, we should be embracing it. We should be embracing new technology and we should be embracing this change because it will lead us to a far better place. Awesome. Look at Homo sapiens. He just needs to have a pistol under his nose, under his nostrils. And that's what COVID did. There was no more time for educating anybody about anything. You just had to act immediately. And if we could get to a situation of that kind <laughs> for the planet, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, think, I think one of the exciting things uh, when we were in lockdown in Mallorca through March, through those few weeks, and which absolutely illustrates what we're talking about is the profound change that was occurring on the island as a result of us not polluting it as much as usual because our habits were changed. You know, there were remarkable seeing dolphins in, in the Bay of Palma de Mallorca, all sorts of things. And on a very small scale, Mallorca illustrated it very well that if we make those, if we choose to make, and, and a lot of them are very small changes, how fast things do change in response. No, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with you. And very interestingly, on a, on a recent um, panel talking about the, the impacts of, of, of COVID on the observing systems, um, because there's obviously, you know, as people can't go to sea and things like that, there has been an impact. But also people were studying the impacts in the, in the way that you're talking about. And some of the data that we're collecting um, on the on the various um, animals, marine animals that carry sensors, uh, but also are on all sorts of other. Uh, they're, they're kind of putting together all of that data, both from land and sea, uh, and air, and looking at, at the 
at what can be detected um, about the changes in animals' behaviour from, from all the, the, the different sensors. So it's almost having um, Hernan's um, uh, idea of the, you know, the impacts on, on land and ocean being connected and put together and your idea there. So, you know, as, as we have the ability to do more observing and more data is, is available and flowing into sort of central systems, then we have the ability to, to look at this. It was a big experiment, as you're saying, and, and it's uh, really interesting to see that. What can humanity do I right think it away? seems to be... Can humanity do anything right away? No, not as yet, I guess. I think we can. I think one of the things is catching people's imagination. Like, you know, David Attenborough catches people's imagination. Uh, when we hear about what Hermant is doing with this new fabric, that catches your yeah. imagination. And interesting, of course, both what you're dealing with and what Hermant is dealing with is about water, one of our most essential elements. Absolutely. And I, 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 I agree with you, Rosalind. I think that highlighting we, we need a, a raft of solutions and I'm sort of an expert in, in one area of, of, of one thing and I'm certainly not an expert in all the solutions, but we, we, we need to have a bigger dialogue about the, the whole of this and, and set our priorities, I think. I think that there are, there's great technologies out there, but I think we would, we, we I think it's helpful to start to, to set those priorities. What would we work on first? Um, you know, perhaps committing national funds as well as, you know, areas that, that entrepreneurs see an opportunity to, to work in. You know, what, what can be done by, by industry? Quite a lot, we're, you know, we're all in this together. So I, I would point out you know, the ocean decade is, is, is important for the oceans. And this, I think we can also highlight large scale events and cooperations where where you know we could house technologies under the ocean decade it's not going to be just about science it's it's hopefully it will be also attract industry and scientists and governments into into greater collaboration but also in in the uk and importantly um coming up in fact this year in november will be I think it's COP26, right? So, and that's going to be held in Glasgow. And we have had now, this is for climate, um, had China, um, you know, commit to, to limiting its greenhouse gas emission. Boris Johnson, for example, has made, um, made positive noises, let's say. And we have, um, you know, there's a, a new um, president uh, as of the of the USA as of the 20th of, of January very important um, that that has named climate as one of the four things that that's important and they want to get on with and India also uh, where Helmut is is um, located that's also made noises in in recent times so I, I think that we we are I mean, I, you know, I cross my fingers uh, on the cusp of, of really getting, finally getting to grips with, with climate. And I, I hope also with the, uh, the monitoring think, that we I need for think, the oceans. I don't think India is following the Paris Protocol as yet because they kind of opted out of it and got an extra 20 years. And I think that they're going to use them up to the last day fully. <laughs> <laughs> there is not much initiative in this country for those kinds of things. Mm. One of the things I feel is that, um, you know, there are a lot of brilliant entrepreneurs and remarkable media companies and other entities that if they could find their way to support this, because yeah. when I talk about catching the imagination. Um, we all know that sometimes somebody comes along and catches your imagination. And that I think that for the general public, those that aren't involved in um, the ocean so much, and, and probably specifically young people, because of course they've got the, the longest time and the, the greatest yeah. investment in this future, to find ways to really ignite. And that's an interesting subject for me, 
as to how we bring creativity into it, which, I mean, Emma's also got a very creative side, which is we've not been speaking about now, but of course that's part of Hermant's story is creativity. Because these are ways that you can just ignite people's interests really. So I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And I think that, you know, if, um, if, if money was no object, right, here in this office today, I, I, I would commission small films and videos, I think. I, I think it's super important, the visual medium in, in one way or another. I, I think I would also go out and maybe try and engage with the gaming industry. It sounds crazy, but when I was in technology, they really knew how to simulate and to work. And, you know, could could there be some some sort of, better visualization of, of our ocean data or some better way of of harnessing you know the, what what the gaming industry knows about immersive um, uh, exploration uh, you know artificial intelligence I, 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 I firmly believe that the, 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 the kind of the big data stuff is, is going to be very important for, for ocean data in, in the next decade and for finding solutions. Um, and also I'd pick up on, on one of Hernan's points, um, sort of perhaps saying, you know, India isn't ready for um, sort of making impact on, on climate change. I, I, I think that COP26 and the work of the um, intergovernmental planet on climate change, they're beginning to get better at expressing priorities, I think, for action, for, um, for, for, you know for for but a mixed bag you know there is no silver bullet we, we can't just like suck all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it somewhere safe you know we need a range of, of of measures including changes in land management so i think some of these ideas of putting the patchwork together as hernan was talking about um are beginning to come together and we'll need new technologies but as those come together I, I would think that sort of India and others would, would be able to follow. And it will also take the work of entrepreneurs and businesses to, to innovate in this space, to provide, I don't know, consultancy services, to provide data, to provide, um, to provide expertise and to provide technology. So I, I think there is, uh, there's good commercial reasons to, to want to get involved. There's good, you know, um, environmental or, or, or humanitarian, if you if you like reasons. But I think there's also good commercial reasons in a in a growing market. We can see already market forces moving away from the oil and gas industry because it, it has a more limited future. We're not going to get rid of petrol tomorrow. Neither are we going to get rid of plastics tomorrow. But the quantity of these things that we need in the future is is reducing. Uh, as we speak and so people who are making long-term investments already see this and so there there is a move um, away from these things which means you know we we want to see opportunities opening up in in new places in renewable energies and and also you know new new ways of of, of managing the ocean whatever one thing, one thing you said emma which i find is is absolutely primordial is, is education uh, educating people about it and even basic education. I mean, the, 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 that's why we mentioned the kids earlier because the ones who attend today will be 20 in 10 years and they will be, they'll be young adults and they can be activists yeah. by yeah. then. And 10 years is not much on our time scale. So no. uh, bringing up the patients probably is the problem of, of actually educating the people. Uh, vast uh, 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 areas of India are still uneducated, unfortunately, and education mm a business in which there are lots of people putting the means into their own wow. pockets uh, and not using it even for government funded education. Um, and so, I mean, my father founded a school and I really know the problem very, very well here in India. Uh, and um, I just couldn't agree more, uh, but I do think that kids just understand the problem and get it if you put it in simple words and that itself would be an education. And you can be sure that that will be a beacon in 10 years. Yes, completely. And Emma, what were you going to say? 
I, I, I completely agree. It, you know, as I mentioned, I, you know, I, I wound up um, in, in the sort of uh, the capacity development uh, sort of discussions at this uh, early in the decade uh, planning. And it, it was a real eye opener for me from, from many different angles. Um, and for example, I mean, you know, you're talking about a broader educational issue, but the, the, the idea that oceans, for, 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 in order for change to take place, oceans have to be on the curriculum just has to be right otherwise people you know that that's that's it's a lot it's a long play in some senses in that it won't happen overnight but in 10 years you have a body of people who are going to come in and start making change in the world and you you already see this happening in interestingly enough um so canada uh, my sister lives in Canada, and so I've been asked on a couple of occasions to to give a talk to um, her class about oceans and oceanography and climate and and what's happening. And the kids are well aware of of oceans and a connection with climate and a, and an impact there and what's happening because I think up in Canada, you know the 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 impact of the, the change in climate is, is, is felt much more strongly than perhaps, for example, in the UK. But um, anyway, so I, you know, I, I really, I really fundamentally agree with you that, that education is a way, not just for oceans, but for other things. But perhaps I can ask you a question. If we were thinking of, of supporting greater education of, of sort of within India, in can it happen using new technology? Is it, you know, if you were thinking of people's mobile phones, is, is this a good way to, to get messages and information across now? Yes, absolutely, yes. They have done the most exper unbelievable experiments. They, what they did was they inlaid a computer screen with a, with a keyboard into a wall in a village in, in South India, and they, they let these... 40 or 60 illiterate kids just go and 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 ask them to solve a problem which find, which which was literally rocket science when i heard about it and the amazing thing was the kids went learned how to use the computer by themselves by themselves and taught themselves what they needed to learn to solve that problem uh, so so it is absolutely possible today and the new formula of schooling is precisely to move away from schooling that was invented in the 19th industrial area, 19th century, and it's going towards more of a computer game in which you, you, you go one step higher each time and you learn more. And, and each individual will thus progress according to his own capacity and not be held back by a class. Perfect. You, you know, perfect. It, yeah. needs to be, it needs to be a kind of a, 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 a video game. It needs, to, it needs to encourage the kids. It needs to, it needs to um, you know, pep up their imagination. And, uh, it, it, and, and they will learn what they want to learn. And I think that is the need of the day. And, I'm, and, and there's so many surprising things that have turned up um, that, that if you just understand that, that each, each living uh, being has its own intelligence, and if you speak to him properly and make him understand that we're on a planet and his world is not in his village, yep. well, that already is a big difference. And that we start understanding that this is our village and that without the ocean, there will be no bees and there'll be no bees, there'll be no honey and there'll be no us either very soon. So uh, we just have to be, we just have to get the message out. And I, and I find that uh, being a bit radical with your affirmations is better. <laughs> So please, I hope I didn't shock you, ladies. <laughs> I think it's extremely interesting is because what you're talking about is that we've got to, it's not about uh, giving people fish, it's about teaching them to fish, isn't it? And then giving them an opportunity to be the fisher. Yes. And then, I mean, if we look at things like, you know, the Parkland kids over the shooting or something, how, they, how much they achieved um, through what they've done and examples like that, and that, of course, because uh, younger people are not restricted in the same way in their thinking as no. often older people are. So if we enable them, and when we start talking about this idea about video games and everything, which is totally connected and, you know, universally possible, um, 
that's a wonderful opportunity, isn't it? And one thing I wanted to ask you, Emma, is that if people are looking for, you know, there may be entrepreneurs out there who've got, who are looking for an opportunity to help and to do something with this sort of thing. How do they come to, how do they come to UNESCO with these sort of ideas? How do they approach? What can we do on that side? Well, it's a good question. A very good question. Um, I would think that if they have ideas, um, they, you know, you, they will have done some, um, you know, they have some connection with with oceans in some way or other, and uh, and a community. Um, and so perhaps through that community, first of all, you know, in one way or another, there are already links that they could use and and a sort of work with and I we, we do get emails from people uh saying you know we're you know we, we we're doing this we're doing that and um we honestly try and find the part of our community because it needs to find a sort of a a home and a uh, somewhere to 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 start to work um as we're a coordinating body okay <laughs> Uh, so we really read and try to seek and find the way to support or to to uh, put that idea in touch with people who we we think it might be of interest to. Um, although I, I will say also that as a as a sort of an intergovernmental organisation, we are also are careful not to favour one particular thing over another, right? Because there's many different solutions and many different ways. And so we also um, sort of don't favour one part of the observing system over the other, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about uh, carefully understanding the requirements. And if it's um, a suggestion that, that meets, a, meets a need, this is, you know, the primary requirement, what, what's the need, what, what, what's your customer looking for? And uh, then, you know, this is, I, I really, I, th I think the opportunities will increase to be able to connect commercial organisations. Um, but, you know, that there are already ways, ways, to, ways to get involved and ways to do that. People out there in Singularity University are quite wonderful. I did a stint there for, for a week in California and Silicon Valley, and then I founded the local chapter here in Gurgaon, and we have just about six people, and we keep on doing educational um, webinars in which we tell young entrepreneurs how they can uh, find technological solutions to their big challenges. Mm. And, uh, and that is precisely the motto of this, of this institution that was founded you know, by Ray Kurzweil and, and Peter Diamandis, who are just unbelievable thinking heads, been going on on futurology and, and, and this moment in time they call the singularity in 2045 when the mass of human intelligence will be overtaken by the mass of artificial intelligence. So that's the singularity and you will probably, uh, and, and we cannot, it, the singularity in time is a moment from which onwards you cannot calculate and cannot take responsibility anymore and they fix it at 2045. So we are in a kind of an urgent countdown already. Uh, but we know that we can find technological solutions to the biggest challenges of humanity today. And uh, we just have to undertake it and have to find the right groups of people. Yeah. It's highly inspiring. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And but, I mean, you know, it's, it's a very good question you ask, Rosalinda, and perhaps we need to do, I mean, you know, we're, we're involved in, in conversations, like for example, the, the Economist sort of business unit is, is helping with a, with a dialogue because as much as the silos need to break down between um, in this, between um, different parts of science, right? So, but also the silos between industry, which works with you know different uh, different drivers, and and the sort of what what science is understanding needs to be broken down for for mutual benefit. There's lots of mutual benefit to be had. Um, and that will will help support some of the things we've been talking about. But that people have got different mindsets. They come from different worlds. They speak different languages. And so for me, this is not such of a of an issue to bridge. I, I really understand what business people say to me because I was a business person. So it's my language too. Um, and I also now understand the language of science and the drivers there and how that's working. And they, they are two different worlds and there needs to be more coming together. 
And I think the US does this a lot more successfully than um, than Europe. You know, at MIT, people sort of get together and, and have sessions. And perhaps we ought to, um, somewhere or other, under the decade, sort of try and foster a bit more um, of this kind of, you know, entrepreneurs but with an ocean focus um, sessions and and that would be a really nice thing to see mm. I have in mind sort of at the moment one, one idea that's sort of slightly different but but maybe it should should mold a little bit to to also encourage this uh, this kind of interaction mm. excellent goodness what a fantastic conversation well you know we have such an exceptional planet we really need to do some <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Just, so when you come to think of it and understand what it really is, uh, yes. how small we are and how much is going on here, it is yep. just mind boggling. It is. <laughs> and so when you spoke, uh, Hernan, you know, about, you know, getting getting children to understand the interconnections in nature and, and how that operates. And, and you know, this, this really resonates with me because that's part of part of my pathway, even as an adult. Uh, I find in, my in where I am so we're, we're never sorry we're never too too old to learn and I, I do think we all need to learn not just the children but I think it's a it's a really great perspective that's what I was coming to our own generation is usually quite stubborn <laughs> well I think the one thing that this last year has taught us all is that we're all yeah. we're all going to be subject to change so we might as well embrace it Yep. and enjoy it and be part of it and I wanted to ask you both I think uh, it's been a fantastic conversation but we're probably coming towards the the end but Hamant firstly if you would like to say something and then I'll come to Emma well all I can say is uh, of course we have a lot of common points with Emma uh, um, and my main point is of course water and I have found this wonderful project in which I will hopefully speak in the next session, in which uh, the solution is that it happens, the whole, the whole uh, project is in the Northern states of India, which has the highest rain, rainfall on the planet. So we're talking of a meter of rainfall per month, and we can thus grow nearly anything there. And, and, and there's abundant farmland and we don't need, and, and in my project, we don't even need to put in any fertilizer. So it's a, it's a project of something that just keeps on growing, but you don't need to do much to it. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And Emma? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much, Rosalinda. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the, the wonderful discussions and interesting ideas. I, I've really benefited from, from hearing the different perspectives. Um, and yeah, I, I guess, you know, the, the closing remarks would be sort of look out for the, for the ocean decade uh, and bear in mind that this is something that we, we all can enact and support in, in our own ways. Um, but, and that it is going to be really important to making a difference for our oceans. Um, and, and also that, you know, I think people will enjoy getting involved. I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting things happening under the ocean decade. Um, and that if we can do a portion of, of what we are setting out to do, it, it will change in, in the sort of the, the fundamental ways that uh, Hernant is talking about our, our relationship with the oceans in this case, but with our planet in general, that we really will sort of come into some of the the, the things that we're, we're talking about and we're trying to envision how coming to pass. So it will be really satisfying to get involved because to be part of those changes and to see them to come to pass is, is I think, um, you know, something both important, but also rewarding to be involved in. Um, there we go. Completely, thank you. I think it is, it's, for me, it's quite magical. For a start, there's something deeply romantic about the ocean, which we can all identify with, but also it is one of those, it, this is something that involves absolutely everything, everybody on the planet. I mean, nobody is yeah. not affected by this. We're on a, we're in a massive team here. So for me, that's tremendously exciting. And thank you both so much. I mean, Hamant, we're looking forward to talking to you next month. That'll be wonderful. And thank you for joining. 
thank you so much, Rosalinda. And just before we close, I must uh, mention the story that my friend Christina in Mallorca told me of this person who lived in the, I think in Buñola, in this little village in the middle of the city, and she had never seen the ocean as yet. <laughs> thank you, Rosalinda, for this really interesting and mind-opening and mind-boggling moment of talking of such things of such great size that it really makes you very enthusiastic. <laughs> yes, and Emma, thank you so much. Thank it's you, too. Thank you for listening in. Hermant and I will be back in February, and we're going to talk about his work and his world, and we'll be joined by another fascinating game changer. Meanwhile, do take a look at the Arts Club page of Rosalinda's culturalcabana.com. There you'll find an invitation to join Anglo-American singer-songwriter Sarah Gillespie and me for live music, conversation, and a very special offer exclusively available to you. To hear more about what's happening in the cabana, do sign up for the newsletter on the Connect page, and I'll send you something lovely from my present box. And until next time, wishing you health, wealth, and happiness. <laughs>